Welcome back, everyone, to Neighbors in the Network. I'm James Pinedo, your host. Today, we have a very special guest, and I'm so excited to introduce to you all Jen Stefano, the Executive Vice President of the Commonwealth Foundation. Jen, thank you so much for joining me today. James, thank you. I'm thrilled to be on. That's great. I'm thrilled to have you on as well. We have a great introduction that I just want to key up. You need no introduction, but our own Meredith Turney was kind enough to prepare one. So without any further ado, Jen is the definition of fearless dedication. She's smart, strategic, articulate, and bold. Jennifer is a passionate patriot and cares deeply about the people Commonwealth serves. One of the things I appreciate most about Jennifer is her willingness to try innovative techniques to reach Commonwealth's big policy goals. And while she challenges her team to think outside the box and how they accomplish their strategic objectives, she never compromises her core values in pursuit of those outcomes. A native of Philadelphia, Jennifer brings that Philly swagger to her work. So this is a warning to those who encroach on our freedoms. Jennifer will go Philly on you. Jennifer is truly an inspiration and one of our network's most dynamic leaders. So again, Jennifer, thank you so much. And with that introduction, shall we get started? Yeah, wow. Um, no, I think we should stop immediately and <laughs> let, let well enough alone. <laughs> Bless Meredith, that was very kind. But yeah, no, I feel like, um, I, I, I think, you know, you never want to follow that. That was lovely. Tell Meredith, thank you. I will, I will. And Meredith's a lovely person. So it yes. makes sense that she would make something wonderful. So thank you. And I'm sure it's all true. And we're going to find out how it all came to be. So tell me, Jen, how did you tell me what's your background? How did you grow up? And how does that influence you now? So I am um, the new greatest generation. I'm Gen X. So I had a very happy childhood where Largely, no one really cared too much about your emotional well-being, which was wonderful. Um, you were not monitored too much. Uh, you could roam freely. Um, your parents uh, were not afraid to tell you you were terrible at something or just, in general, not be overly concerned. And that was great. Um, we grew up in the world just as, the you know, before the Internet was there. Um, but then we're young enough that when the internet came, we could take full advantage of it and learn it, but we're not digital natives. So we lived our life offline. And I think that truly um, is such a gift. And more and more of us in Gen X, when we talk about this, sort of the, the gift of freedom that uh, these children don't have today of, of um, a monitorless state, a monitorless world. Even your parents had limited ability. So um that's partially how I grew up, but um, I, I thought that was um, something just funny about Gen X. And I think, again, why I say we're sort of the greatest generation left alive. I always say, what, why, why are we, why is Gen X so great? It's because um, the greatest generation, our grandparents, like we were their favorite, the eldest grandchild, and we had mm -hmm. um, shared enemies, our baby boomer parents and our millennial siblings. So the <laughs> greatest generation and we in Gen X bond it well. And we learned a lot from them. God bless them. I miss them. I miss all my grandparents. So. Well, I, the stories that, that, uh, they shared with us, we need to keep living on. I know my, my grandfather served in world war II, And so I loved being able to talk to him about that. And yeah, it, that, I think that's something the network does well though, is remembering stories like that. Uh, so that's, I, I want to hear more about that, but tell me you grew up in Philly though. Was that, so you said it was a gr your great you're the new greatest generation growing up in Philly. Were you thinking about politics as a kid? No, I well growing up um I would say I was raised by Kennedy Democrats. And okay. um I quickly I love to read and I really credit my mother and father with that. We just had houses full of books. We always had the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Forbes, Fortune, Times, Newsweek, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, which it's amazing. I'm a columnist now there that, that, that sort of was, these were the papers and the news and the books of our lives. And so I was always with people who were constantly reading and very well engaged and very well informed. And at dinner every night, um, unlike conventional wisdom, which says don't have on TV at dinner every night, we watch the nightly news and then switch to PBS, um, the business news. And we, so not only discussed and debated world events at our table from a very young age, we then discussed business. My father was an entrepreneur. Um, and so it was always on my radar, 
Um, I always had strong opinions. I always was up against uh, my father who told me my opinions were ridiculous, which was really helpful and prepared me well for politics. Uh, it always is good when you start out very young with someone saying you're an idiot and you don't know what you're talking about. You learn to come back strong. So I appreciate my, my you know, my father's uh, not being overly solicitous towards some of my views at times. So it really taught me to think and how to think and how to reason and to kind of go back and look and figure things out. But we, you know, overall, I could probably make a liberal cry at a dinner party, but I I would never have gotten involved in politics. It's what my father would have called like the pinko commie hippies. I don't even know what that means, but that was sort of what politics was for. And, you know, these Kennedy Democrats uh, who became Reagan Republicans, they were very focused on, you know, you work, you do a business, and then you vote for people like Ronald Reagan and everything works out. Um, but it's not true. But growing up, I would say John Kennedy was by far my role model. And, and in many ways, when I look at the language and the way he spoke and the things he believed, how he understood America and our ancient history and how he understood freedom, I would say we need someone that kind of thinking and, and that kind of way of speaking and leadership. What did he understand about America that you don't see in our leaders now that interests me a lot? So I think Kennedy was, um, first of all, he was educated in the classical manner. And yes, he went to Harvard, but not the Harvard of today. He went back to the Harvard when it was truly a liberal, um, that's, you know, capital L, the classically liberal institution um, that that taught about um, the, our, our ancient heritage stemming from Cicero, right? Cicero um, in ancient Rome had a great influence on John Adams, who was really the, the invisible, I always call him the invisible hand founding father, sort of ignored between two giants, but I think he had a huge influence. Um, and going back to ancient Greek, John Kennedy understood that history. He cared about that history. And he thought it was very important to bring that forward and, and his language of freedom. I mean, listen to these words, we will pay any price, we will bear any burden, we will support any friend or oppose any foe to ensure the survival of liberty. I mean, think about that. That was his inaugural address. You know, we're proud of our ancient heritage. Let the torch, you know, let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. They were born in this century, tempered by war um, and a hard and bitter peace. And they were proud of their ancient heritage. And his whole inaugural address goes on to lay out the, the, the pride of the American heritage and how you carry it forward in a modern way. And he also had a number of speeches that talked about what I call the moral rot of the United mm -hmm. States. Now, that is the move away from liberalism to this oppressed oppressor narrative of good and evil, right? Where the liberal model is the line of good and evil runs through every man and woman. Um, this new Marxist model is good and evil is between you're either an oppressor or the oppressed. And if we decide you're the oppressor, then you're just evil, which is why you're seeing so much anti-Semitism right now, because the Marxist powers that be have decided that Jewish people are the oppressors and are now not blinking or not concerned or even cheering when 1,400 innocent Jewish people are slaughtered because they are Jewish. Um, so uh, that's sort of how I see the morality. Yeah, so if I was gonna boil it down, what you see what you saw in JFK was really an appreciation of history, which is yeah. something that is just really sorely lacking right now all across the world. It's not, I don't even think it's a left or right thing. I think it's a, just a universal thing in our country right now is the lack of history. Yeah, I mean, even I feel I had a great education, certainly through high school. I thought mm. college, it was fine, um, but I studied business, which really doesn't emphasize philosophy and, and literature and, and history the way I would have loved to. but. I had to teach myself about ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and its influences on the founding. I had to go deeper into the founding. A lot of my education is self-education. And I think um, I still got more in school than maybe my, certainly than my kids do. So I, I homeschool sometimes. I, I pulled them out just to get that Greek, Roman, classical education, the great books, into their world. So what? it's interesting. What drove you? So I understand you teaching your kids, like you were saying, but you said you educated yourself. What drove you to do that? Well, I'm very curious about things and about life. And like I said, I 
always lived in a house where people were always reading. My parents were just very well-read people and I was interested and I was curious and I wanted to learn and understand more. And one thing would lead to another. Um, I admired Kennedy, so I started to learn about Churchill. And of course, you can't really understand Churchill unless you understand Napoleon. And, and you really can't understand Napoleon until you start to understand, um, you know, Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Sixteenth. And then you can't really understand the American Revolution until you understand the French Revolution. And you really can't understand the French Revolution unless you understand Edmund Burke's, Burke's view of it versus Voltaire's, which then would lead you to go understand Catherine the Great and, and sort of what happened in Russia, which then leads you to serfdom. And oh my goodness, wasn't well, that interesting, which then leads you, um, you know, to Bastier and, and then so on and so forth. So I'm just a curious person. And also, um, being from Philly, a natural pugilist at times. So um, when I was in college and it was being taught economics, it was all Keynesian. And I felt like I'm raising my hand. I think this is a lot of this is nonsense. I know, you know, there's, I understood capitalism, right? My father was, you know, rose from nothing and became, I ran a business. So I started to just research, um, you know, alternatives to fight with these economic professors and here, you know, I, I, I stumbled on to people like Hayek and Milton Friedman and et cetera. So which led to Thomas Sowell, which led to this and that. So I had this all within me. And I had a very strong personality, uh, strong opinions and could make a liberal cry at a dinner party. But it was all a liability. It was not useful. My um, um, my personality, my way of being, it was always seen as a problem. My aggressiveness is problematic. And all this information and curiosity was not being used for very much. Um, I was in the business world and then I was a television reporter and anchor, but it wasn't, it was underutilized. So it, there it sat. Even um, as a reporter, I mean, this natural curiosity and this pugilistic nature it, from an outsider. I, I took some journalist classes in, in, in college, so maybe I'm not completely an outsider, but at least from my limited experience, it seems like it could serve someone well, but you didn't find that? No, I found um, doing local news, it, it was, I mean, there was no intellectual pursuits. It wasn't what you would think. It was an endless fight. Everybody was left. It was just an endless fight to even get a, a, a right leaning perspective in. And, and it was nonsense. And I was a PBS, right? So, and there was just an assumption that the world, it, it was the first time you kind of came up against illiberalism. You know, this idea of we're going to parade out democratic virtues, but, you know, behind it lurks fascism. That's sort of how I describe it. In that they just, they assumed the world was one way. They assumed everyone believed that. They, there was no actual curiosity on the people in power or what have you. And, you know, I just didn't want to do another local story on tax day or it's snowing. You know, I stood in hurricanes um, and covered hurricanes. I was nominated for an Emmy and that was exciting. But it, it just, no, I would say not until I became a political commentator did it get fun and interesting. Hmm. Two questions come from that. Um, what happened? Like, was it always been that way that reporting is dominated by one side that's not interested in asking questions or even being curious? Or is this something that changed? And when do you think it changed? Yeah, well, I, look, I'll go back and answer the question. Um, everybody is biased. That is true. So I think like when, the, you know, this whole concept of unconscious bias, yeah, no, of course, everyone comes with a bias. The idea that you don't have a bias is in fact a bias in and of itself. Um, it's a delusion. So back during the revolution or the leading up to the revolution, there was a free press, but um, the, the, it was a trade. The press was a trade and papers had perspectives. They had points of view. They were not trying to be something they weren't. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, our famous Philadelphian, the first American, um, Philly guy. So he, um, he used to write under pseudonyms and write fake letters praising himself. I mean, it was always biased. And I think where it got completely corrupted was, frankly, when it came out from being a trade and moved into the academy and moved into the universities. I think it was a huge mistake. I don't think you need a university degree or certainly not even a master's degree to be an excellent reporter. You need to be naturally curious. And I think um, I would just feel a lot better if people said, I do have a bias and this is my bias that I'm covering this story. Um, or other people have said, if you really care about politics, then you can only cover sports or if you can only cover sport, you know, which I don't think would work. I just think state your bias, call it a day. And, and, and it's okay. 
So, and then you could still have ways to kind of give a balanced approach, but I think I did not study communications. Um, I don't, I think if you want to go into that world, go into that world. It's like how I feel about wanting to cook. Don't go to culinary school, go travel the world and work in kitchens. And I feel the same way about 99% of things. Before you spend money on it, have someone pay you to do it. See how it goes. I love it. I, that's, that makes complete sense to me. And actually, in those few journalism classes that I took in college, the reason why I ran from it is because I got the sense that it was an institution that was utterly and completely convinced of its own sanctity, just as like, we, we, we are the purest of the pure. <laughs> And in my mind, I was like, well, I'm not that. And I doubt that everyone else here is that. So I'm, this is, ugh, this is a little gross to me. Um, and, and is went, that something, yeah? Yeah, and it went from just the facts, man, right? Like just the yeah. facts, what one we're on now, to I'm going to be an activist journalist. You know, yeah. I think Woodward and Bernstein sort of, you know, everybody wanted to be them. Like, you know, and I think it's like these two nerdy, geeky, reporters like were played in the movies by Robert Redford, who was like the hot, you know, be like be played by Brad Pitt. And I think they became glamorized. And then all these like activists are like, I'm going to go follow the money and uncover the scandal. And it's just like eye rolling and eye watering. And that really wasn't the intention of journalism. So what we, what I think we're still holding on to this unbiased approach, my argument is just be biased, which is why I like writing a column. I'm, I'm bound ethically to live in facts. But I may gather them and give my opinion on them as I see fit. You have um, no which, choice. No yeah. one has a choice. Which is really that. what the news side does, but they pretend they're not doing it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so you you said you didn't go to school for communications or anything like that. So how did you get into journal? Was that your first stop in, as a career or did you yeah. have another? Okay, what was the stop before that? So I, I graduated from business school and I went uh, to work for one of the big five consulting firms and uh, I hated it, hated corporate life. And so I decided I was going to be an actress. And, uh, you know, my father said, well, you can't take the luggage if you go to L.A. So I was like, oh, I guess I can't be an actress. But I was trying to figure out what do I want to do or be? And I, what am I good at? You know, you're in your 20s. What the hell am I good at? And I'm like, oh, I'm good at talking. So I decided to go be a TV reporter. I thought I'm good at talking. I'm interested in life. So I talked my way in um, to a TV station and um, the guy gave me a job and I waited. I remember I waited him for like six hours, day after day after day. And he never, he would always stand me up and be late. And he finally brought me in. He said, fine. He said, I can't hire you as an intern because you're not in college. He said, I'll give you five days. You either get hired or you're gone. And I got hired. And then I worked my way up and then, um, you know, became a TV reporter and anchor and then, you know, quit and decided I was out, went back to the business world. And the next day got nominated for an Emmy. So that was funny. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that seems like a very interesting story. I have other questions in the back, but I, I can't just leave that right now. How did that happen? how did you get nominated for Emmy, an Emmy right after you quit? What was that like? Yeah. I mean, they, um, I guess the news station submitted one of my reports and it got picked up and I got nominated. And we went, um, it was cool. Um, I went to the Emmy Awards and, um, but I didn't win and that's okay. I still was nominated and that was exciting. And, but I, it was time for me to go. I just couldn't stand the bias and I didn't, mm. I just felt it was not a constructive life to spend your whole life running around fighting people to just have an, you know, a, a, the opinion of the left and the right or to not constantly speak ill of Republicans or it was just silly. Yeah. Well, okay. That... I have to go back to that question because I'm so curious and you have an insider's view here. So you said that everything got a little bit dirty when we got too pure and as journalists where the, we said we can, it it's, belongs to the academy, but that doesn't explain how it's all one-sided, like you said. How did that happen? Like, where did that come from? Well, I think, I think that's unclear. First, I think um, that journalism became about activism and conservatives don't raise children to be activists. Ah. And I think on the right, activism was seen as a dirty word. It's something the so-called hippies did or that, you know, people protested and they were avant-garde. And now I think we know that it's very mainstream to challenge the authorities. But I think prior in, in another generation, um, 
the conservatives held the power. They ran the elite institutions. They well, or what I would call not even conservative. I would call traditional liberals, classical liberals were running the institutions and were sort of in media, but because it became, it began to be seen as activism and um, people like Saul Linsky, who wrote rules for radicals and, and was a rat 60s radical sort of taught the baby boomers that that was a virtuous way to go. And the left leaning people got the memo and picked it up and went. And mm -hmm. Linsky's rule was get inside the institutions. And they did. Now, when I picked up his book in, you know, 2010, I guess the first time I read it, um, I'm like, this is very sensible. Why are we just letting left wingers do it? Like, let's steal his ideas. He dedicates the book to Satan. He's not going to mind. So let's steal his ideas and let's do it ourselves. And I think, you know, we, we build institutions, but I also believe get inside them. Um, it's why I'm a columnist at the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is a very mainstream left-leaning newspaper. Um, so, and, and you know that because it gets nominated for tons of Pulitzer Prizes. It's very much part of the legacy media and establishment media. But I think we have to be inside those institutions. Yeah, it's and I've count. heard you. I've heard you give that advice to young people when you're giving a talk for young Americans. Um, they, they, you, you'll have that message like, go in. in Become that sleeper agent. Yeah. Yeah. And be, you know, there are three keys to success in life. And I, I it's three things. Be polite, be punctual, be useful. Mm. And encompassing that is morality and ethics, legality, but be polite, be punctual, be useful. Like having etiquette and manners is about thinking less about yourself and more about others. Being punctual is a sign of respect for others. It's, it's about honoring your commitments. Your yeses are yeses. Your noes are noes. You say you're going to do something, follow through and do it. And be useful is, again, thinking less about yourself and looking out, where can I help? Where is their opportunity? Where is their problem? What can I do to solve it? Which is de facto entrepreneurial action. That's what, entrepreneur, that's what entrepreneurism is. Like, you don't need to get in depth. Don't go nuts about it. Don't need to take a course of study. Don't need to major in it. Just do that. Makes sense. Okay, well, you've helped me understand quite a bit what you were seeing as a reporter, but I, I uh, something that I skipped over because I got too interested in all the reporting side. What was it about the corporate world that you just couldn't stand? That's a great question. Um, I it, it, it's interesting. I think in some ways it's like a government bureaucracy. Bigger corporations have to have a lot of rules and checklists and regulations, and there's not a, a lot of room. For entrepreneurial endeavor, um, I just found it is not the life I wanted. I didn't want to be in that world. And it's it's hard to put an exact finger on it. I, I probably shouldn't say I write it off forever. That was at the very beginning of my career. So maybe today I would love it. But I, I think um, I like more entrepreneurial endeavors, things where you can grow and learn and um drive both your career and um, drive ways that you can add value to something meaningful. And, and to me, again, um, I tell my children, you'll never want for money or meaning if you help other people be successful. And, and that includes, look, you sometimes have to fire people. You have to have hard conversations. You know, it's not always pretty, but you have to think of others and how things work for them. So, and I think there wasn't a lot of room for that, if I recall, in the corporate world. But I was there a very limited time. And I probably don't have any modern perspective on corporate life. Yeah. Well, I would, it seems like you're quite the entrepreneur. Would you say that? Like, and, and you need that uh, ability to create. And maybe it wasn't there. I, I think the ability to um, be curious and solve problems and be adaptable are things that I value in a job and, and, and I value if we care about something important, I like, we should be able to adapt Yeah. without chasing every shiny object, right? There's a fine line. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So um, you have left the reporting world. Um, take me what, what happens now after that? So I went back into the business world. Um, I started in my own business and um, 
I sort of was a COO for hire and um, worked a lot. And then I decided to have children and I thought, oh, I'll stay home for a little bit. And that's sort of what I intended to do with no real future plans. And um, and then I fell accidentally into politics. I stumbled upon a political rally. And um, I guess it was during, you know, the right, the beginning of the Tea Party. And the next thing you know, I sort of said, this is really cool. What is this? Because it was about limited government. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% for that. And then the next thing you know, I'm on Fox News, CNN. I'm in the New York Times. I'm... And it just sort of proliferated from there. How did that feel? That's a big jump going from, you said you were just raising your kids to being in Fox News, New York Times. That seems like whew, quite a, chi- a shift. Yeah, I, I think I was ready for it because I think I said before, everything was sort of a liability. And then all of a sudden I realized why, you know, why I had a big personality and uh, you know had all this stuff that I was learning. I was able to put it to good use. and. Um, what thrilled me the most was that you all were here. I will tell you the truth. I had no earthly idea. Like I said, I believe what I believe. I'm a classical liberal. I'm a free market person. I, I thought there was the Republican Party. And I wasn't too impressed. All of a sudden, I fall into politics. You're all here. SBN, Heritage, Atlas, you know, Cato, Americans for Prosperity, all, all these, the Commonwealth Foundation, And then there's the Commonwealth Foundations in every single state, right? There's IJ, there's this whole world, this whole freedom movement that I believed in and thought about and was learning. It existed. There were all these people in this movement that had come together to, to, to advance civil liberties, civil rights, individual rights, freedom. And I thought, Baby, where you been all my life? But I'm so grateful to the people who built it, what I call built this house, that there was a home for me to land in. Because I don't think I would have, you know, I'm running, I'm, I'm, I was pregnant again. I'm running protests to DC and Harrisburg. I never did any of this before. So it was so wonderful that I'm on, you know, national television and people from the movement would call me, say, hey, we saw you. Is there anything we can help you with? Is there anything we can do? And I'm like, this is awesome. So it was a great, great to realize um, you are all here. That's beautiful. I, I, what I hear is it's really, there's this community of freedom lovers that really, I, and beyond just freedom lovers, people that are not stopped by making someone angry or hurt by disagreeing, like just able to just put their opinions out there. Like they, we're not, it doesn't seem like we want to hurt anyone's opi- like feelings or anything like that. But everyone that I've spoken to on this little podcast has really been okay with not agreeing and going with the flow. Is that what you've found? No, I think people are passionate um, on the right as they are on the left. Um, I worry that people on the right are becoming, you know, I call it faux offense you know, faux offended that they're, we're adopting some of the characteristics of the left. While I understand why it's to call them out on their hypocrisy. So they say things and we're going to be offended by it. I would also argue we have to set a good example and we have to be different than them. So I think generally everyone I work with, yes, there's, there's varying points of views. We have really hardcore libertarians um, at the Commonwealth Foundation. Our former board chair just passed was a Democrat. Um, she was a Democrat. Her father was a Democratic governor of Pennsylvania. Um, I There are Democrats that we're working very closely with. Um, there are people who are pro-life. There are people who are very pro-choice. Um, we live in a world on the right where I do think you have to be more open-minded because you have social conservatives and, and social liberals and and varying points of views across the spectrum. And there are some things that unite us, but there's a lot of things we all disagree on. I always, I was showing um, one of my progressive friends, National Review and Reason Magazine. And um, and I said, you need to read these. You'd think it was two different worlds, but it's not, it's one world. But they're both pro-freedom. They come at it from varying perspectives. Absolutely. I want to really take what you, it sounded like it was a a very prudent caution 
at, at the beginning of that response. Can you restate it for me? Because I, I might have missed it. It was something about be careful not to adopt the same uh, tactics that people who disagree with us might adopt. What was it? Can you restate it? Yeah, I mean, just like try not, you know, here's the Gen X in me coming out, but like, let's not try to be, you know, I call it like the Italian soccer player response. If you ever watch soccer and the Italian soccer players, like if someone just brushes them, they fling themselves to the ground and they roll and roll and roll around. And they're like grasping their arm and screaming. And I think that's how I see a lot of progressives behaving when they hear things they don't agree with. But I also have noticed people on the right will do the good old fashioned Italian soccer player if they're offended. And, and my argument is stop. It's fine. Note that you're offended and note that you can live. Like set a good example. Yeah. One of my mentors would put it as deny the outrage sort of thing, yeah. that, that outrage yeah. machine. Yeah. Like the, the, the faux outrage, foul rage. Like it's, it's nonsense. I'm, Pull it together. You know, we're never going to win another war if everybody keeps flinging themselves to the ground. <laughs> you know, every time you hear something that like does not comport with your worldview. Stop. Absolutely. That You're makes being ridiculous. Sense. Makes complete sense. Okay, so back to, back to your story. So you've found this community. Um, yeah. And I think your first... Um, your first actual, at least according to your LinkedIn, was uh, your first stop in the movement was Americans for Prosperity. Is that right? That's right. I worked with Americans for Prosperity, and I so love and appreciate David and Charles Koch because I came in. They never asked for a resume. Nobody ever asked what my background was. They certainly didn't do a criminal background check. Could have murdered <laughs> one. They wouldn't have known. But, and well, I you do in. have what looks like an axe handle back there, so... So it is, in fact, actually well called. It is, in fact, an axe. Hasn't been, <laughs> I promise. But, um, but it's um, the truth is, I started out as a part time communications person in the state. I was a stay at home mother. They didn't know what my experience was. And I was able to quickly work my way up to an executive. And they were an absolute meritocracy, which is sort of what we're arguing, um, which is, just let people have opportunity. And that's what I did. I, I took advantage of opportunities. And then it was time for me to, you know, leave. I really wanted to focus on Pennsylvania. And I knew Charles Mitchell, who is Commonwealth CEO. And a donor said, well, I'm going to have him call you. And I thought, oh, he's not going to call. And he did. And we met. And um, I was very, very pregnant again at the time. So I warned him. I said, you're going to see my stomach before you see me going to come around the corner <laughs> and um and you know we hit it off and seven years later here we are that's beautiful mm -hmm. that, tell me though like what was it i still want to get a picture of what was it that drew you to american i understand wanting to go back to philadelphia but what was it like jumping on board for in the liberty movement for you so i think all the things in my life that I cared about and believed in and all of um, things that I loved about America, I was able to do something about. I was able to do more than just make a liberal cry at a dinner party. I mean, the house that you all built, that SPN was here, that I could focus in the state. I mean, Pennsylvania is, an is a significant state. I mean, we are, what happens in Harrisburg impacts what presidential candidates are going to say when they come through the state, right? The path to the White House runs through Pennsylvania. And it matters that we get it right on public policy. And you can have much more influence here. But I got into the movement because I really believe there was an opportunity to advance all the things I believed in about the United States and do my small part in what I call bringing home the promise of the Declaration of Independence to all people. Mm -hmm. That is what I feel is our moral obligation as an American citizen. And those of us lucky enough to be born American citizens should recognize that, that we laid out what good looks like for the whole world. I mean, American exceptionalism is only that we are an exception to every other nation on earth in that we were formed on the idea of the individual over the state that one human was worth more 
than any power dynamic, any structure. And our whole history then has been writing the course of human history so that that was respected. And I just to be able to s- contribute to that in a small way it leads to a very meaningful life, in my opinion, for all, for myself and I hope everyone else in the movement. I love it. But I'm so curious now, what was it like with your family? Like, what did your spouse think? You jumping in with this grand mission, adventure. Well, my spouse is the best person I know. And he um, he um, loves me for who I am, including some of the cra- <laughs> some of the crazier things I walk through the door with. So when I first started doing this, you know, I came home one day and he's like, so what? what are you doing? He's like, I know I saw you on national TV. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I know you're taking like 25 buses to Washington tomorrow. Like, what do you do? And I'm like, I fight for freedom. I'm a voice for the voiceless. I take on the evil left. And he's like, you know, I'm, I fight for freedom. And he's like, okay, so you're a Jedi. I I could hear it. I'm like, boom, boom. And then like the Star Wars thing came to mind. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's right. I'm a Jedi for freedom. So that was really funny. And I think if you ask them, what what does your wife do? Um, I think he would say, piss off progressives. But also win them over. I try more. It is not my, the whole own the libs. It's adorable. Bless them. I think there's two ways uh, to defeat your enemy. One is to obliterate them the other is to make them your friend. And I am much more intent in this phase of my career to win them and bring them in than to own them. I love it. Well, I, and by the way, I think we can win over not just liberals, but I think we can win over some progressives. I do. I think there are really intelligent progressives who just have very big hearts and they don't always just like we don't always have the full picture and the full knowledge. And when I find some of them to be very open minded and interesting, I certainly think the anti-Semitism uh, from the left has traumatized some progressives and certainly Jewish progressives. But, you know, any good, decent and moral person, even if they're a progressive, is shocked by this. So I think um, we have a real opportunity to try and a moral obligation to as well. They are our fellow Americans after all. Well, um, a little bit about me. I'm a refugee from uh, Los Angeles and I 100% agree with you that all of my dear friends in Los Angeles that are on the progressive side are are mostly good people. I mean, there's there's exceptions, but 100%, I think that there's, that there's common ground that can be found. What is it that people within the movement need to say or that what how can we how can we reach that common ground? Well, I think the first thing is um seek first to understand before being understood. Everybody everywhere is terrible at that. But if you truly want to win, seek first to understand and not okay, what do you believe? Okay, let me tell you why you're wrong. But take a sincere posture of asking good questions, which are the Socratic method, who, what, when, where, why, and how, and learn what it means to actually listen, to really listen to someone. And then to, you know, the, the, the great, the best way to win any debate is to start in your head with on the first, argue it from your opposition's point of view. That's rule number one, know it inside and out. And I find on, on, in the freedom movement, we do not know and understand the progressives inside and out. We do not understand what drives them. We do not understand their heart. And we do not understand the issues. We only look at it from our perspective. And by the way, that's how they look at us. But so always argue something from their side first. Number two, on that which we can agree, should be you should have a list of things under the headline on that which we can agree. You best are most likely to win a debate by getting them to say yes to key points and then build your case from there. And of course, I'm always big pointing out hypocrisy 
And mm-hmm. Americans hate that. There's a low tolerance for that in our society and pointing out the hypocrisy and pointing out where the ideals are not being met. This is honestly what happened in Russia and why so many people defected to the United States who were devout communists. They thought it was a, a system that could prevent the world from what happened in World War II. I mean, there's a lot of good people who thought communism would be better than capitalism at preventing a lot of deaths and destruction. And when they figured out they were wrong, um, they defected or they left or they turned on the Russians and you have to give people that grace, give them the opportunity. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I know that we're over time here. Do you still have a few minutes? Can I? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. So tell me about, tell me now that you're with Commonwealth, I wanna dive into that more. What, what has that journey been? And can you maybe point out a uh, specific impact or moment that you've had that you saw a real change in your community from all of your efforts there? Yeah, it's 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 really thank you for asking that question. Um Commonwealth Foundation is you know my people, my tribe, my home, my community. And um I love the people there. I I love our donors. I love um the lawmakers we get to work with. I love that we do work with Democrats and get to to meet with them. I'm actually scheduling a meeting with a Democrat right now. Um and I think that's wonderful. But I'll tell you, I I saw the impact just today. Today, I went to a school in um, one of the roughest neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Um, it is where um, if you went to that local district, elementary school and high school, um, the reading and math proficiency is near zero. It's, it's, it's not even, I'd have to check to see if it's one of the schools that has zero reading and math proficiency. It's horrific. It's an abomination in the richest country on earth. It is shameful and it is morally egregious. Um, so we were at a school called Cristo Rey. It's a Roman Catholic school where they only go to school four days a week and they work one day a week and they work at corporations all over the city of Philadelphia. And I went in a place, I think in, in this part of the Philadelphia of great despair of, um, of what they call the the doom loop or or what have you, um, of 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 drugs and violence, and here was this beautiful monument of hope and students that were happy and engaged and one hundred percent college acceptance, one hundred percent, um, and on par college graduations with um, the highest income levels in the nation, and these are all children from low income families, and we were sitting with the president, and he told us that without the tax credit scholarship programs in Pennsylvania, including one of the newest ones that we worked on over the last two years, they would not exist. Or they would have to scale back and cut back so significantly that they would leave behind to the neighborhoods in those failing schools more than half the kids. So education isn't the only thing we fight for, but in my life, that has always been something that is vital and important. And my family was big on giving people scholarships to the Catholic schools. It never occurred to them to fight in the public policy realm. I'm so proud to be able to fight in the public policy realm because while I don't have the money to give scholarships to millions of children, I can still impact the lives of millions of children by fighting for these public policies and and fighting for economic freedom so that when they graduate these schools, they can stay in Pennsylvania they can become entrepreneurs, they can find jobs, they become skilled tradesmen, they can build businesses, they can build institutions, they can have low cost energy, and they can change the, the Pennsylvania can fuel the world, mm. can build for the nation, can make the goods and services that all the world needs. And I'm excited to be a small part of that through Commonwealth Foundation. A worthwhile goal and an exciting one that I but I, I just, it gets me going. It's like, let's march, let's do it. Any other big goals that you want to share there at Commonwealth with, that we can share with the network here? Yeah, I think the, the, the biggest goal I have, and I would challenge everyone to think through this, um, there are people out there and they own the libs. And um, you know what? They're fun and it's great. My challenge to all of us is what if we won them over? What if we brought more progressives and liberals along with us on key ideas? It doesn't have to be every idea. 
but some. And the first thing you have to start with is to remove yourself from the binary idea that there's a good and evil side. That's not true. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and I'm sorry if I'm saying the name wrong, he was um, a commander in the Russian army during World War II, and he privately criticized Stalin, Stalin, and they threw him in a gulag. And Solzhenitsyn came out of that experience, and I think he said one of the most brilliant and important things that we need to remember in this movement, and that is this, that he was convinced after his time in the gulag that the line of good and evil is not divided by state, nor political party, nor ideology, but it runs directly through the heart of every man and woman. That is where good and evil resides. And if we remember that, and we remember our classical liberal roots of being able to hear and tolerate ideas we don't agree with, and bringing people along, and changing our own minds, and being open to ideas, I think we then have an even greater ability to change the world. Beautiful. Wonderful. Well, I feel like I could keep on asking, asking so many questions, but I've already taken you over time and you've already been so generous and I look forward to chatting with you more in the future. I just have one last question. Sure. Who else can you nominate for us to interview here on Neighbors in the Network? There are so many people that I find completely fascinating in the... SPN world. Um, I think, have you interviewed my friend Stephanie in Tennessee? No. Interviewed, oh, magnificent, top notch. She's a killer. She's awesome. She's getting stuff done in Tennessee. She does not play. She is here to win. And she's a fantastic person. Highly recommend you interview her. Wonderful. All right. Well, I look forward to chatting with Stephanie. Thank you so much. I, I am so grateful. I, I have so many more questions and so many uh, things to think about. Um, and I can't wait for the title of this. Uh, you've given me so many good titles, but the title of this podcast is probably going to be the best yet. So <laughs> thank you so much. You exceeded merit in this introduction. So thank you. Well, thank you, James. You're a great interviewer. Thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks for listening to Neighbors in the Network an offering from the State Policy Network. We hope that this podcast can serve as a place for empathy, understanding, and human connection. Please let us know about your thoughts in the comments section. And thanks again.